Hello, my name is Oliver Schmidt. Today I'm going to show you how to listen to Steve Wozniak, the creator of the Apple II, right on the Apple II. We won't use any sound card for the audio output. Rather, we just connect an ordinary amplifier to the tape out jack of an enhanced Apple IIe. Okay, let's get this started. The software we'll run is my program A2Stream. It uses an Apple II Ethernet card to receive specific audio files from the Internet and simultaneously play them through the Apple II stock speaker circuit. A2Stream does though by creating a 22 kHz pulse width modulation signal purely from precisely timed 6502 code. Here we have the URL of the Open Apple podcast episode featuring an interview with Woz at Kansas Feast 2013. Now we switch on the amplifier and hit enter to get things going. After saving the URL for reuse, A2Stream dynamically creates 17 kilobytes of 6502 code that make up the actual player. Then it connects to the HTTP server. And here we go. Welcome to the Open Apple Podcast, where we celebrate the Apple II. Whether you're a longtime user, a nostalgic visitor, or a newcomer to the community, join us as we share news and memories of Steve Wozniak's most famous personal computer. You're listening to the Open Apple Podcast. My name is Ken Gagney. This is Mike McGinnis. This ends our live demo. However, if you want to listen to the interview, just let this video continue. Please note that the sound you listen to is still coming from an Apple II. Otherwise, thanks for watching and if you like the video, please like the video. And here at Kansas Fest 2013, in addition to a spectacular keynote speech by Randy Wigginton, Apple employee number six, we are also graced with the presence of Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak. Hi, Steve. Hi, I'm very glad to be here. I'm a little tiny bit embarrassed because I'm more out of the Apple II world than all these other guys here. Um, but you built the Apple II. Oh, I built, oh yeah, yeah, I understand. I understand everything going on, but it more gives me memories of the most fun times in my life, playing with the little software and the tricks and the hardware and hooking things together and keeping things cleaned up and uh, a lot of, lot of good memories, but I've been away from it for a long time. Now, you haven't been here to Kansas Fest in 10 years. What brought you back this year? Um, my schedule is almost always crowded. This year it was also very crowded, but something cleared up at the last minute. And I heard Randy was going to be here. So even if I'm only here for two or four days or something, I really wanted to hear Randy's talk. He was such an important part of Apple. You're talking to him, play number six. He was in high school when I met him and hand-wired with him an Apple One board for him to have. He saw the Apple One before Steve Jobs even knew it existed. So, I mean, Randy has an incredible amount of history in Apple, both in Macintosh too, MacWrite and, and the spreadsheet and a, lot of, and a lot of great history even since Apple. So, you know, I just respect him. I really had to be here for that if possible. And thank God something canceled on my calendar and I was able to get here. When is the last time but, seen but I'm going to do something very unusual. I have a calendar that um, has, I speak around the world and these speeches on in innovation stuff. And the speeches come up and regularly and my speech agents have the right to put them on the calendar anywhere there is. But I'm going to block off next year's dates if I get them. Oh, that'll be wonderful. Oh, wow. I want, yeah. Oh, no, I want to be back here. This is just, the, you know, people having fun with computers in a way that they don't have that same fun with the modern ones, mm -hmm. really. People like to use them and show off what they got in the latest app, and I know this little this little um, side trick, you know, and this little shortcut, but they don't really go in, go in deep down inside and really play with almost, you have to create when you're doing stuff with assembly language, you know, or peaks and pokes. Every single year I was invited, every single year I looked on my calendar and saw that it was either unlikely or impossible and maybe some of those unlikelies cleared up. It was also a long ways to come to Kansas some of those years. I mean, sure. My wife, we're, you know, we got married five years ago almost, and uh, she's from Kansas, so we have a lot of family here, so uh, two birds. She was Apple all the way, and of course I had a big education 
background. I taught, I even taught fifth grade for um, eight years, secretly, no press. She was a teacher for 14 years. She worked for Apple Education here in the Midwest for a long time. Then she moved to corporate and was going on all you know, the big worldwide deals. So uh, we're just a perfect match. You know, <laughs> I even consider, I even test out and I'll carry other phones. And if, and if I'm having trouble with Siri, I'll try it on, I'll use my Google right. phones, you know. And I like, I like, I don't really criticize people that don't use Apple, but she's more Apple only, <laughs> more <laughs> solid Apple. I like that about her though when I met her. <laughs> she's more Apple than you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we met on a geek cruise for Macintosh people. They had classes on the ship. She was a teacher, and then I was a speaker. That was the first time we met, although we didn't really, you know, meet very much for a couple more years. So when was the last time you saw Randy? You know, we get email. With email, you see everybody everywhere. You don't even know where people live anymore, or but you, you know, or what their address is, but you're always in contact with them. So Randy and I are in close contact all the time. Do you stay in touch with a lot of the early employees? No, I don't. Um, very infrequently, I bump into one. I stay in touch with Bill Fernandes, employee number four. And he was my technician at Hewlett Packard before we started Apple. And so I invited him over, but he's also the one that introduced me to Steve, Steve Jobs. So a lot of interaction. As a matter of fact, Randy mentioned Homestead High School, where he lived. It turns out that I did a calculation once out of the first 10 Apple employees, seven of them had worked at, um, had gone to Homestead High School. Very, you know, we're just in that neighborhood. But I met Randy by accident at the club. And, uh, you know, he just wanted somebody to drive him that lived near Homestead. And I lived in these apartments right by Homestead High School. and. You know, met a lot of other young people, too. I didn't mind. Randy was an important part of the Apple II happening, and here's why. I was very shy in those days. Wouldn't really talk to people, but I would drag stuff down to the club and set it up on a table so I could show it off. Somehow I could show off technology, and people would ask questions, and I could talk to them. But I couldn't ever raise my hand once in a meeting at the entire Homebrew Computer Club. Here's Randy. He's one person say, showing an interest and appreciation. Not that it's money, but, oh, my gosh, these computers are so cool. We can have our own. He wanted it. Well, that inspired me to make, think it had value. So Randy was a big part of that. So was young Chris Espinosa in the club, one of those big fans that, you know, that convinced me that there's a lot of people that actually like these things and want these things beside myself, and I've got a little following, and that really pushed me. That was my inspiration was those people, you know, as much as anything. We wouldn't have Apple if I didn't have, I don't know. I was so shy. I'd build one for myself, but I would be, you know, afraid to do anything with it unless there were other people around enjoying it too. So anyway, Randy, a very, very important um, part of my life for ages and ages. Like I said, uh, Randy saw the Apple One and knew of it before Steve Jobs did. You know, it was just a computer that I was handing out at the club and helping other people build their own if they wanted. Speaking of the Apple One, we have one here this year. So amazing. Every time I see one, I'm in such awe because I know how rare they are. You know, because in the big auctions of the world, how high a price they sell for speaks to how rare they are. And the Apple One, you know, I, I sometimes think of the Apple II was a great computer. I had not designed the Apple One to be a computer. I quickly modified a terminal I built to get on the ARPANET, which Steve Jobs had found a way to get, get us money for from a timesharing company. But I had modified it by adding a microprocessor, some RAM, and more importantly than anything, the ROM. You boot it up, beep, and it's watching a keyboard type instead of a bunch of little switches with ones and zeros. And I'm not a mechanical type. I wanted to get away from the front panel and toggling switches and drilling holes and all the mechanical stuff. Well, you can do it all in electronics if you have a keyboard. It gets too interesting. These are the most interesting times in my life. That was the most fun time in my life. Project after project after project leading towards the Apple II. And the Apple I was not that great a computer because it was only text and it was only 60 characters a second. Why was it only 60 characters a second? That sounds dumb today. Well, it came from a terminal that was only going to talk over a modem. And modems could only go 30 a second. I optimized the cost and the size of parts to always be the most efficient for the job it has to do. So the terminal didn't need to go faster than 60. You'd never see it. Now, when I converted it to the Apple One, it was kind of slow. And then I had this great idea for color, and I couldn't add it to the Apple One. I tried and tried. It was getting to be too many chips. So I said, scrap it. Design a computer from the ground up, starting with color at the center. And after you have the color timing, generate the color NTSC television, then generate the computer, the processor signals over that and the RAM signals, and then grow it, you know, so the, so the very heart of it was really a color television generator. 
So the Apple One, although I didn't think about much about it, sort of forgot about it over the years and kind of scrapped them and didn't think, oh, this is kind of nothing. But now there's so few of them. But what it did to the world was everyone at the club looking over my shoulder, all of a sudden for the first time saw the formula. An affordable computer that can run a programming language like BASIC. And the key to it was you had to use dynamic memory, dynamic RAM. All these little hobby computers like the Altairs, they all had static RAMs. You know, look at an Intel data sheet. Intel data sheet, microprocessor has address pins that go on wires to a static RAM and data pins to a static RAM. So they all, they, all they did was copy Intel data sheets and put it in hardware. I totally designed from the ground up and I said, how do I get the fewest parts and the lowest cost? And it was dynamic memory was, was you know, one of the big um, fundamental breakthroughs of the Apple. It was even in the Apple One. And the whole, the whole paradigm that it's a low cost video terminal with a, your own television set is free. So that's the only way to get the cost affordable for the useful machine, and the hobby machines were on the wrong track. But everyone looking over my shoulder now saw the formula. When I look at pictures of the Apple One, and now a few real ones, but I look at a picture of it, and I see, oh my gosh, I can take myself back to 1975. And I say, once you saw that many $1 chips doing the whole job of typing in basic even, you know, I had to write the basic to make that impressive, but once you see that many $1 chips, the formula was out of the bag. This is how you make the computer of the future. Every computer since the Apple One has had a keyboard and a video display. Every computer before the Apple One had a front panel. So it was a huge turning point. So when I see one, I know how important it was. It is, but I didn't think at the time because I thought the Apple II is going to be so much greater. And you always forget the earlier things, you know. But it started a great company, too, if you think about it. You know, and Steve Jobs did not propose starting a computer company with the Apple One. He proposed starting a component company to build the PC board for $20 and sell it for $40. Everybody could plug their own parts into it. They could get their parts and plug it in. We didn't have any money to build them. So, so really, the start of Apple Computer was not to be a computer company. And then that came about by, um, you know, Steve is a great businessman. And he talked to Paul Terrell at the bike shop. And Paul wanted completely built machines. We had the right one. So Paul Terrell took the financial risk. The parts suppliers would supply us the parts with 30 days to pay for them. But Paul Terrell told them he was going to buy the computers for cash when we built them. So the parts suppliers that, that gave us the chips were sure that we'd build them in less than 30 days and get paid. You know, you do whatever you can when you have no money at all. Steve and I had zero checking accounts, zero friends and relatives for money. I mean, just... You know, living out of your garage. <laughs> that kind of arrangement that Paul Terrell gave you would never fly nowadays. Nobody would put up that kind of faith. Yeah, you're right, because, you know, it was a strange time. Computer stores were popping up, but there were only about maybe 10 in the country or 20. Every city might have one little mom-and-pop guy like Paul Terrell. I got a little money. I'm just going to rent some vacant space for in not a very good part of town. And I'm going to just say sell computers to these geeks that come in. And so these computer stores were starting up. I'm just on an idea to sell things like Altairs, you know, at first. But then everybody wanted a ready-built computer. And the Apple One was easy to build because it was all one board. And that put us in business. I mean, we didn't make a huge amount of money. But you know what? Two kids out of a garage in those days, we made 10000 bucks in about half a year. That was in our bank account. My salary as an engineer in those days would be 20, was 25000 So 10000 was still respectable. That was enough to let us move out of the garage into an office building. And the garage is kind of a misnomer, although that was us. That was our storefront. The computers got manufactured where the PC boards were, were manufactured. All the parts got, got soldered in there. And then um, all the business got done in Steve Jobs' bedroom. And we didn't have a phone in the garage. The garage was just a table to get the computers, test them. If they work, drive them down to the store and get paid. So how many Apple One boards did you actually build? Out of the um, I, we did two runs of 100 PC boards. Um, I think probably, I'm guessing that 150 got sold. And if there were 50 left at the end that didn't get sold, and I remember Steve sort of announced to all employees, if you want one, you can come and get it and get a board and... Be, now everybody thinks back, I wish I'd gone and grabbed 12. And I, I don't know why there's, I think there were only 25 actually in this possession at that time. But theoretically, there are more Apple IIs than just six or eight working. Sometimes you read those numbers. But there could be more Apple Ones than that in the world. I was recently at, a, at a, an event in San Jose, California, at their History Museum of San Jose. They have one, and Wendell Sander brought one. Apple engineers and Wendell Sander. I brought mine. My friend Alan Baum brought his. 
and somebody else showed up with one. We had like, I forget, five in one place, in one room. Jesus, but none of us, not one of us would sell it. None, no. So how many did you hand build? Because you'd mentioned that you okay. shipped them off to... I, I, I obviously, I hand built the prototype, but the way I did was I plugged chips in. I don't believe I used sockets on my prototypes. I have to go back. Yeah, I did use them. But I plug the chips into little blank breadboarding boards of Hewlett Packard. And then I, I do this at night. I, I look at my, my design on paper and I'd solder one wire from pin five of this IC to pin six of that IC and I'd put a red, a red line on my paper so I'd know on my design so I would know which wires I had wired. Then I'd wire the next wire, solder here, solder there, solder here, solder there. The wires were cut to be exactly the right length so you wouldn't have a ton of wires bunching up in the air and getting in the way. Like another, the form that was more popular for prototypes was called wire wrapping. But I believed in doing the point-to-point -point soldering. And, of course, I would have to hold a solder, the wire with my left hand, the soldering iron with my right hand, and I'd hold the solder in my mouth mm -hmm. and, and move it down and put... That's how I soldered. I was a good technician, uh -huh. great technician, as well as engineer. So I uh, just you do everything, you know, in those times. So I hand-built the one that was the prototype I brought up. And the first RAM I tested it with was um, 4K bytes of static memory. But then, you know, I realized the 4K dynamic RAMs came out that summer of 75, and I bought some AMI ones, and I got it working with them. And when Steve Jobs finally saw it, he said, well, why didn't you use, did, would you consider using the Intel RAMs? I said, yeah, but it'd be too expensive. I could never afford Intel. And he says, well, what if I can get some for free? I said, oh, my God, they're better. They're TTL compatible. The voltage levels are lower. And, oh, my gosh. And, yes, you have to do two sets of two sets of addresses but because the chips are smaller. They take up less space with fewer pins, and that still means less, less complexity and more reliability. They're really the best chip. So he got the Intel chips, which the whole world was going to wind up going with, got me some for free. So I put those on the Apple One and... And uh, everything about it was just yeah, was was sort of sort of neat. I, I would never do anything behind my company Hewlett Packard's back, so I offered it to them. They turned me down five times. Wow, five different times. And um, the first time was just to start a company to make this product. My division wouldn't do it. My calculator division, I wanted them to do it. I loved. They were my friends. I wanted to be important there, and they wouldn't do it. Okay, they turned me down. So we're going to go ahead and make PC boards for twenty bucks. And after we made our first PC boards, Steve got the deal from Paul Terrell for $50,000. <sighs> Scary stuff. I went back to Hewlett Packard's legal department. because I wasn't going to risk my job at Hewlett Packard. And went through the legal department. They circulated my description to every single Hewlett Packard division. And to tell you the truth, by this point in time, I was hoping that they would turn me down. And they did. I was really hoping we'd have our company, Apple. You know, this was kind of cool where just the publicity was all positive because there was no big market. In it. We were not competing with the big computer makers. So they kind of didn't care to say bad things about us or to anti-market us. They just thought it wasn't going to go anywhere. So that was the second time they turned me down. And then they started a project in my lab at Hewlett Packard with a microprocessor. I'd already built the Apple One. And with a microprocessor, they had dynamic memory. I'd already worked with dynamic memory and come up with great parallel designs. They had a TV display built in, a little tiny black and white, you know, and I'd just done it for color NTSC. Um, they had a tape drive, you know, expensive commercial tape drive. I just used cassette tapes. They had five guys writing a basic. I'd just written the basic. And I said, please, my life is not calculators, it's computers. Please let me be on this Capricorn project. And they turned me down. They wouldn't let me shift to the Capricorn, the computer project. Well, thank heavens, we wouldn't have Apple today if that, yeah. if they had. <laughs> so coming from from that kind of background, and now it's how many years later? Thirty six. Thirty six years later, what's it like to come to a place like this where you still have all these fans and people who are dedicated to your the products of your imagination and your creativity? Uh, my creativity kept me trying to keep up with the technology world. I loved gadgets. I loved hi-fis before Apple, plugging things together, owning little bits of electronics after Apple. And then we had some success. I could afford gadgets. And I kind of went with all the newer, modern trends, trying to keep up and use the devices and be a part of that world. So I um, eventually, not right away with the Macintosh. It was quite a ways into the Macintosh before I... Um, even before I stopped using my Apple IIs, I used them for quite a long time into that, actually, and got a lot of use out of them. I'd have three Apple IIs using each one for different parts of my work, my engineering projects on little side companies. Um, but, but eventually I got separated from the real deep Apple II community, which was going to go on for a long time. 
and I had gone, you know, I'd, I'd been back to Apple and the Apple II GS got started, you know, and I saw what it was. I look back now and I have a lot of almost regrets about the past. When I see how decently the Apple II GS was working the mouse type stuff, you know, and, and, and what the software could have allowed it to do, I almost think we missed the early boat in um, GUI computers. You know, by by really trying to kill the Apple II. See, I was and it was hard for me because I was in the Apple II division when I went back after getting my college degree, and we were not being ignored by Apple. You know, everybody on Apple had to have an Apple III on their desk. We were being killed deliberately. For ex I mean, for example, we just we just showed the disc two here, but everybody knows we went to the three and a half inch disc with stuff from Sony, and in the Apple II division, we were not allowed to buy a two sided disc because the Macintosh only had a one sided disc. They wouldn't let a better one be on the Apple II. And so, you know, there was a lot of horrible things going on. We were just spoken of as being bozos in the Apple II division. But um, you know what? I think of one thing. You know, I'm one person. I basically designed the whole computer myself. Yeah, there were important things like the disk drive. Randy had an important job, but I'll tell you, I told him what to do, <laughs> kind of. But, um, but, you know, but I, I saw the whole disk picture in my head. But, you know, there were other parts of it, and there were a lot of other people that contributed over time, but pretty much it got created originally just by one person, and it was all the revenues and profits of the company for the first 10 years, you know. And so that's respectful enough, and I don't need to do more things. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't fight. I also am not political. I will never try to tell somebody, well, I'm, I'm better than you at thinking out the ideas. We're going to go my way. So I would never run a company. And those business people, they would just chew me up, you know, so I never, I'm only at the bottom of the org chart, an engineer, that's my life. And, but anyway, so I, the Apple II is kind of the, those fun days when I come here at K-Fest and I see it, and I just know how much incredible fun I had doing those things and playing with little code, trying to figure out things, especially, you know, copying the disk drives and all that. I used to, you know, study the, the hexadecimal in memory. But it's gotten really uh, quite advanced. Some really incredible people here that uh, just inspired me with their presentations. Yeah, and like I said, I, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to block next year's time on my calendar. I rarely, rarely do this for an event. It almost has to be a family wedding. Yeah, well, no, it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful that it worked out and you were able to be here. Do you still have an office somewhere at Apple, and do you still collect a paycheck? I do not have an office at Apple. And I do collect a paycheck, but it's very tiny, like a couple hundred bucks every two weeks comes in the mail or something. My accountant tells me some low number like that. And I just want to be the only person who's been on Apple's payroll computer every day since the start. I was never off. Even when I had my plane crash, even when I went back to college, I was getting the small paychecks because I didn't want to be off the computer. Yeah. So I don't know if they ever come up with a... Uh, um, oh, what do you call it when you have a, a pension plan? If they ever come up with a pension plan, maybe I'll rank high. The people here, too. You know what? Meeting all these people that really love studying the little tiny details of a, of a computer the way I did back then. I'm kind of past that now because I'm just public figure and, and all this. And, and it's the thing that I love to do the most. You sometimes get detracted from if you're open to the world. So, but I'm meeting these people and seeing what they do and they, they love and live and the fun they have. And, oh, just wishing it was me there. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you next year, Steve. Okay. I hope to be at Kansas Fest 2014. Apple II forever. This has been the Open Apple Podcast. Find more episodes, read our blog, or send feedback by visiting us on the web at www.open-apple.net.